Okay, thank you very much for the <coughs> informal discussion. Uh, my name is Ere Ogunse Santodosua. This is now for the first time in this series. And uh, this is something we do every other week to bring uh, distinguished speakers to our campus. And today I'm delighted to introduce Pauline Lubin, who uh, has uh, been in contact with the UCI program in public health for about two years, and we're lucky to have her in our midst for this quarter, and hopefully this is the beginning of a longer term I like so she You heard that, right? Uh, okay. works with us, and also at the UCLA uh, with the National Children's Study Committee Engagement uh, Unit. Uh, she's She's got a fabulous website with the documentation of the work she's done as a photojournalist and uh, some of the work has been uh, selected as finalists for the Pulitzer Prize. That's uh, given by Columbia and, and the New York Times? Or no, Columbia it's Columbia University. University. Yeah. Uh, You'd think it was the New York Times because they win a lot they, of Pulitzers. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but she uh, completed her MPH at, at Johns Hopkins uh, in a a track that includes health uh, and crisis and humanitarian uh, work. And uh, she's traveled twice to Iraq uh, to cover the war, and both times working independently of the military, so not an embedded uh, right. journalist, and focusing on the impact of war on civilians. Uh, she also covered the uh, first Gulf War, photographing refugees in Jordan who fled Kuwait uh, when Iraq was invaded. After that war ended, she traveled to Kuwait and, and southern Iraq to cover the aftermath. Uh, since returning from Iraq in 2004, she has focused a lot of her coverage on the impact of the war on people who live in the community. Wounded soldiers, those with post-traumatic stress disorder, Gold Star families, Iraqi refugees, activists on both sides of the war, and families of deployed soldiers and Marines. What she's had since uh, that period is uh, looking at all of this from a trained public health perspective, and this is what she'll share with us today. So thank you again for being thank with you. us. I forgot I told you all that because I was going to tell you some of that in my talk. Well, so I'll repeat it because I can't shift gears now. So yes, we're going to talk about, um, you know, I'm teaching this course and, and thanks, um, you said some very kind things about my being here. I'm really impressed that I came to Daly in uh, December with this sort of general idea about teaching a course on war and public health. And he was very kindly enthusiastic about it. Um, and then in the spring I sent in the syllabus and um, Part of why I want to talk about this today is that there is a lot of discussion about how war affects public health globally. So clearly, I don't think that it's something a lot of people are thinking about. There are researchers who are looking at it. There's actually starting to be a lot of DOD funding to look at how it's affecting uh, military families and soldiers and stress on them, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Not a lot of people are looking about at refugee populations in the U.S., and people are going over to Jordan and Lebanon and, and doing health assessments and health, health, health outcomes research on uh, refugees in Jordan, who f I mean, especially people who have fled Iraq. Um, but we have a, and I'll talk about this later too, there's a population of refugees here that have not just fled the war in Iraq, but previous wars. And there's a strong public health component to that as well. And most of the public health component admittedly is mental health. Uh, but mental health has a major effect on, the, on public health. It has effect on families, communities, violence, and, and I'll talk about all that. Um, and in fact, recently, um, the reason I think this is a really important thing to continue looking at, and I hope there are researchers that will continue uh, pushing this uh, and informing policy, is if you recall in the recent budget debate, they said, oh, we could save trillions of dollars by ending the wars and bringing troops home. My feeling is save at least one of those trillion because I think that there's going to be an enormous cost and a lot of work to, be, to do to rehabilitate people, uh, both physically, emotionally, mentally, their families. And so I don't know that we're going to save trillions. I mean, we'll save trillions, but you know, we need to set aside some of that funding. And right now, there's quite a bit of funding. The White House has funding every year for uh, meeting the needs of military families. 
you know, my fear is that's going to dry up. And these are the, they didn't volunteer. You know, you can say soldiers volunteered. Soldiers will get access to benefits from the VA. Though I don't believe that reservists do. And if anybody here knows, um, I may not know enough about it. Um, so there's, you know, we, this is a war that's being fought by people in the community, not just people who volunteer to be active duty. So for lots of reasons, I think it's an important issue. And I've always been the kind of person, even when I worked in journalism, that while everybody else was looking at one thing, I'd be like over here going, taking what some people call the contrarian view. And I think that this is something that, um, it served me well, but I also think that um, I spent most of my life asking the question, why? My license plate when I lived in Michigan just randomly was 977Y. And <laughs> I was coming out with the work one day with my boss, and he's like, oh my god. He said, that is a personalized license plate from you. Because I, it's just, it's an important question to always ask. So what am I gonna talk about today? I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about my journey from photojournalism to public health. When I was at Hopkins, um, well, when I was, my, one of the last stories I did when I worked in journalism was about Iraqi refugees who had moved to San Jose from Baghdad and, um, I forgot that, I called it, um, I forgot the title of it now, but from Baghdad to something. Anyway, I decided to call, um, my journey is actually from Basra to Baltimore, and that's what I was saying at Hopkins, because I had really, I think my experiences in Iraq were the thing that finally motivated me to do this. Um, I had thought about public health over the years, because I'd always been attracted to health-related stories and stories that were really more about health policy. Um, one of the very first stories I did was back in, there was a time when the living wills or, or the documents that people signed to say how they want to end their lives if they're ill, there were a time when those were not always legally recognized. And this was, I was working in Michigan, and Michigan was one of the states where they weren't legally recognized. And I thought, wow, people should be able to, you know, there was a lot of talk about people being able to take control of how they ended their lives. And so I, one of the first stories I did was a, a personal um, a journey, a, a focusing on one woman and her decision. And so um, my motive, my methodology, which I didn't call it that till I went to grad school, I used to call it a way of operating. But it is a methodology was to talk to what I now know are key informants, uh, meet with groups of people, and even do almost what I now realize are many focus groups, and identify the issues that are really salient in that community, and then find, as a journalist, find like an individual or a family whose life reflected those themes that people identified as salient themes. Um, so uh, yeah, I called it Baghdad to Baltimore. And then I'll talk about, again, why, why war is a public health issue. Uh, but more importantly, why war is a public health issue in this country. And uh, as I've said already, it's a very much neglected um, focus. And then finally, in case you're wondering, and I guess even if you're not, um, I'm going to give you an overview of uh, running through some of the issues that I think are the public health issues that are affected by war and how it affects the community. Bear with me, I'm a little bit of a technophobe. So um, I was a photojournalist for over 30 years. I was 12 when I started. Um, <laughs> much of that time, as I've already said, was um, a focus of putting a human face on stories that were in the news or issues that were being debated publicly. And when I did have the privilege to travel to any conflict zones, my mission there was to cover the personal impact. Um, and I'm a believer that obviously the, there's a strong uh, relationship between the personal impact and public health, how, how it affects people individually. Communities are made up of individuals, and the personal impact of something ultimately does affect public health. Uh, and again, this is a lot of this, I guess, is, is sort of focusing on the mental health aspect. Do we need to turn the lights down? Okay. We We're not going to show a lot of pictures, but. Oh, you're not. Not you're a lot. No, no. Just a little. I mean, can you guys see the. I mean, I'm going to show a couple videos, but very short clips. Um, okay. All right. Um, so, as, as, as you were already told, I was in Iraq twice, um, covering the impact of the war on civilians. And then when I came home, I really decided that I wanted to focus on how it was affecting military families and soldiers and their families. And it really started with. Um, I don't know how many of you, are, is anybody here from the Bay Area or Silicon Valley? Okay, so you know um, Palo Alto VA is about a mile from Sand Hill Road, which is, I call ground zero for venture capital and 
the technology boom. And the boom was, the bubble was huge at the time, and there were all these people working on Sand Hill Road making six, seven figures, which I, I'm not opposed to, and I wouldn't object myself, but meanwhile, a mile away were people recovering from wounds that they'd sustained in the war. Um, and there's, whatever people think about the war, whatever your feelings are about war, and I, I'm not traditionally a strong supporter of it, um, people are bearing a burden of it that other people are oblivious to, and young people saying, oh, I'd go too if I could, but you know, I've got this job as a headhunter. Um, so I felt it was really important a mile away from Sand Hill Road to really put a, hum a human face on the war. And it took a while to convince the Veterans Administration to let me do that. And um, that was really the beginning of this journey for me because um, I did a story on an individual soldier and then I realized, of course, it's, more, it's about more than that. It's about resources. It's about health systems. And more importantly, it's really about families and the role of the family and then how it affects the families. And, and he had a wife, he had a kid, everybody on that floor had a wife and children. I also realized some of the other things I'll talk about, um, which is that a large part of the VA population now, the young population, people are not there because they got injured in the war. They're there because they got injured after they got home. That's because of effects of the war on them. Um, so just some, I'm not, there's not a lot of facts and there's not a lot of data in this presentation, but anywhere from 1.5 to 2 million have served in Afghanistan and Iraq. These are some of the figures on uh, killed versus wounded. This is a little more graphic illustration of it. So if you think about the wounded, they come back to the community. They come back, uh, this is where the, to me, this is where the public health and community health impact comes because uh, there's a high rate, you'll, as I'll talk about later, there's a high rate of PTSD and other disabling injuries and someone's got to take care of, of these people who are disabled. They're no longer able to support their families. Their families are taking care of them. It affects their families. It's, uh, to me, this huge effect that I just don't, I don't even know where, what we're going to see until they all get home. Um, wait, I want to go back, sorry. Okay. Um, and so to put that in context, you know, after the Vietnam War, we saw elevated rates of PTSD. Um, this is where we started to see, or at least pay attention to, a lot of homelessness and substance abuse. Um, there's still research being done to confirm the role of chemical weapons there. And so there's good reason to believe that we will find similar, if not more severe, public health consequences of the current war, um, partly because the, um, the mortality rate is much lower in this war. People uh, are more likely to survive their wounds. Um, and so it stands to reason, and again, there's still not a lot of data on this, but it's obviously it's longitudinal. There's, it stands to reason that this is gonna have an even bigger effect. And if you have higher rates of PTSD, which I'll talk about later, substance abuse, homelessness, inability to, um, to be, uh, live independently. And then uh, the final thing I'm going to talk about is uh, this is sort of the list, you know, and these are the, the various w things that I'm going to talk a little bit about. This is more going to be more of an overview, and I think it's to give you a way to think about it. Maybe for some of you, um, I think it could inform uh, research that people should be doing or might do. Um, I do, my impression is that there's, um, at the moment, there's quite a bit of funding from the DOD and other organizations to be looking at how the health effects and the public health effects of war on soldiers and their families. And so I feel like it's an untapped area um, that the RAND Corporation is doing a lot of work on it and a couple other uh, researchers. There's some people at Hopkins that have done some studies. But you know, if you do a search on war and health, if you do a search very quickly even at the library, a huge percentage of what comes up is global health. And you don't see a whole lot of work still being done on the domestic impact. It's starting to pick up steam. There's a lot more now than when I applied to graduate school. When I applied to graduate school, I was looking for something to sort of quote in my, my essay. And the, the only thing I found, and I'll talk about that later too, was actually an article the New York Times did about uh, the rate of domestic violence and other crime in a military community. Um, so the signature wound of the war is, I'm going to go down the list now. Any questions so far? Comments, questions, complaints? Jokes? <laughs> okay, traumatic brain injury. 
uh, which is being called the signature wound of the war, and it's caused often by the signature weapon of the war, which is an imp the improvised explosive device, IEDs. You guys all familiar with this? Okay. So, um, and whereas lost limbs were the visible injuries that veterans had in past wars, TBI scars are largely unseen. In this case, it was, uh, this is the guy I did the video on, and I'm going to show you a clip. This is Frank Sandoval, who there's a, mo the way most people are getting P TBIs is there's um, the waves that are caused by explosions create pressure on the brain and just basically rattle it around. It's actually, uh, there's a lot of cross, uh, there's a lot of sharing of data now between people who are doing research on um, <coughs> injuries to football players who get maybe not necessarily hit in the head, but get shaken up quite a bit. And there's some people in Livermore that are looking at redesigning uh, military helmets, but the but but uh, public school, particularly uh, football programs, are really interested in what they're doing also. Um, so that's I guess the other way it affects public health is there's research being done to treat wounds from the war that are going to be applicable to other uh, parts of the community health. Um, and so uh, tra traumatic brain injury is usually a result of a sudden violent blow to the head which causes the brain to collide with the inside of the skull and then the collision can bruise the brain, tear nerve fibers and cause internal bleeding. Um, but um, as I said before, a lot of people are coming home with TBI that don't even know it yet. A lot of it's undiagnosed. Um, there's a, uh, researchers are starting to see a pretty strong correlation between TBI and PTSD. <coughs> And they sort of, it's sort of a volatile mix. In some cases, I know with Frank, uh, his neuropsychologist said that the only good news was is because he didn't remember the incident, he doesn't have PTSD. Um, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't know which he would rather have had. Um, so I'm going to show you just a little bit, um, mostly so you can stop hearing me talk. Uh, I'm going to show you a little bit of this video. And, and when you look at the video, I want to take note that, um, I th as I said, I thought that this was just going to be on how it affected one person's health, but um, it's pretty evident even in the clip I see, and think about it as you watch it, that it's about the system, it's about resources, it's about the family, and, um, you know, the, the VA and, and um, the staff at the VA taking care of these patients is starting to take an emotional toll as well, and so you have um, I don't know that anyone's really looked at rates of, of PTSD or other kinds of uh, anxiety or stress disorders on employees at the VA, but you know, up until this war, they were used to dealing with older patients who lived to be 70 or 80 and then eventually died because of a lot of that was age-related illnesses. And now they're seeing a lot of young people come in with, you know, pretty awful injuries. Some of these are the same age as their own kids. Um, and so, I'll show you this clip real. He apologizes a lot. Oh wait, hold on. I need to, um, I'm not hooked into the audio. Oh. I may have messed that up. Is there a, uh-oh. It's not a silent yeah. video. Yeah. I don't see it, sorry. That was the one thing I forgot to ask about. There's no random oh, cords. Yikes. Yeah, okay, guys. Does this work? No, it's not that. No, but I could put this up against oh. the. No, this is light. This is a light. Wow, there's no microphone. Uh oh. Yeah, I think we'll have oh, to. Oh no, you have to actually have plugged it into the computer. Laptop computer video. Well, no, but it's going to be on the laptop. Yeah. Um, uh oh. I yeah, can't. Let's see. Can you try it again? Do not apologize to me. No, no it's not, not me. Not, this. Not hmm. Oh here. There it is. Oh, there we go. Glad somebody knows what they're doing. There you go. That's it. Got it? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, guys. Thank you. Try that and I'll, you can also Otherwise, I, would, I don't know what I would have done. What? You can also adjust the sound. Play it again, I think. Um, oh, I see. I you have to make it a slideshow again. <laughs> What's going on? Tell them you want to apologize to me. So, thank you. Are you going to get better? Okay. 
and he stays quiet and I go, are you going to get better? And he asks me, yeah. I'm like, okay, let's go and apologize. He was the boxer that you could be punched, you could be knocked down, but you keep your guard up and you look for ways to continue functioning. That's what you do in a fight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. tough day and then you know I gotta have a tough day too but we'll move to the next. You both take the right I know. I don't <laughs> see you know me doing this with anybody else. I don't and even think of the same thing that you know he's left through that. I'm going through this with him so it'll make it a lot easier. Yeah I think we I think it's a real thing. It's a lot. It's a different kind of bond that we have, not just as a husband and wife, best friend, partners, everything. It's made more of a definition of the whole relationship. I have to keep being here for Frankie. I can't, you know, just let go. If I give up, then Frankie has an opportunity to give up. I get upset with him because I know he can do everything that they're asking him to do. Sometimes, and we can go to dinner then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's just a short clip of it. It's really, it's like a 30 minute piece, but, um, you know, his wife is only 22, 23. She was in high school when 9-11 happened. So she's very young and she's bearing this incredible burden. And at the time I remember thinking, um, this was going to be the rest of her life. Now, I don't know how many of you are going to go watch it, but I will I'll give away the ending. Uh, Frank went home. He was okay. I mean, as okay as he was ever going to be. He actually ended up coming back for some routine surgery to repair that, um, to put a bone flap in, and he actually died from the surgery. So his wife, of course, had gone through this incredible thing with him um, and even, you know, said to me, what, you know, was it all worth it? And so, of course, I, I can't even imagine the long-term effects on her. They had a five-year-old child who had seen her father in the hospital, who had seen her father go through all this, who lost her father, um, had to, you know, come to a funeral, bury her father. Um, Frank was not just going to support his family. He was going to support other, there were other relatives counting on him. I remember even before Frank died thinking Frank is not going to want to live like this the rest of his life. 
He was very traditional guy, sort of this big macho strapping guy, married his wife, was going to take care of her. Um, and that was not, you know, he, he was actually going to probably be better off physically than he was. He couldn't talk, and that was going to be his biggest issue. People assumed that he was cognitively impaired, and he wasn't. So there was that kind of stress. Um, you know, he had always wanted to go into law enforcement and be, you know, in the FBI, and he would still talk about it, and it just wasn't going to happen. He was going to live the rest of his life dependent on his wife. Um, so this was what started bubbling up for me, how this is, the ramifications of this are huge, and I don't, I don't, I myself don't know what the solution is, but I felt like I wanted to be more part of that than just photographing it and hoping somebody else would go, oh, gee, that's really a shame. And then what? So um, here's a few figures. 1,800 U.S. troops have suffered visible traumatic brain injuries. 30% um, of troops who have served for four months or more are estimated to have uh, unseen uh, TBI. Um, and because they're unseen, the diagnosis, as I said earlier, is often delayed. And the public health uh, effect of that is exacerbated by the fact that it's often, uh, TBI is often, it's often accompanied by unexplained behavior changes, uh, erratic behavior, um, you know, abusive behavior, or just behavior that, that leads to negative uh, outcomes for both the person behaving that way and the people who come in contact with him. Sufferers uh, of TBI also have vertigo, loss of memory, chronic headaches, difficulty concentrating, some have cognitive damage, adverse personality changes, and depression. Um, and at times the result um, is permanent brain damage, um, which requ or requires at minimum physical uh, extensive physical therapy, um, and at, at minimum recovery is often incomplete. I mean, Frank's was sort of an extreme case. Most TBI is not quite that visible. Um, his, 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 it was just sort of his luck that the part of his brain that was damaged affected his speech and affected his swallowing and his ability to eat because uh, it obviously he wasn't cognitively damaged but it, people couldn't tell and his own buddies came to see him when they came home and they were really concerned that he was cognitively impaired. Um, but, but the bottom line is that you have permanent disability here and you have people who will be unable to hold jobs um, and there's also some research that says that um, there's an increased risk of Alzheimer's later in life among people who have TBI. So these are all health issues. Um, the RAND Corporation, um, the, the statistics I showed you earlier, um, the RAND Corporation points out that that does not take into account reservists and National Guard troops uh, who are fighting a good chunk of this war alongside the active duty people. Um, and again, considering that reservists and National Guard troops are more likely to live in civilian communities, the connection to the community's health and public health is pretty clear. So um, then there's PTSD and mental health, other mental health issues. Uh, we know a lot about the role of the spread of infectious disease due to war. We know the, the history of smallpox and war. I, I, I don't know if all of you do that. There's a strong link of, of to that. Plus, there's increasing evidence of the role that war plays in the transmission of HIV AIDS now. Um, in terms of you have people in refugee camps, you have uninfected people coming in contact with people who they not, normally not come in contact with. Um, you have um, human trafficking that's a result of in a, in a number of war zones. You obviously have rape as a weapon of war. And so war is really contributing quite a bit in sub-Saharan Africa to the spread of HIV AIDS. Um, but there's really no measure, but there's not, not been much measurement of the historical mental health impact of war, um, because for the most part, people didn't pay a lot of attention to it. In the old days, people went off to war, they fought, they came home, they got jobs. I mean, I really wasn't, my father was in World War II, and I didn't realize till I really became more versed in this topic, he clearly had PTSD. Um, first of all, my mother says that his family tells her that he was much mellower before he went off to war. And I won't go into too much detail, but it turns out, you know, when he came home from the war, we were always told that he went to live with this aunt of his because he'd lost a bunch of weight and she was going to fatten him up. His mother had died. He had terrible emotional, he was a wreck emotionally, apparently pacing around and having awful flashbacks. And I never got a chance to talk to him about it. I found out a lot of this after he died. Um, but no one talked about it for that, particularly in that generation. But even after Vietnam, people really weren't acknowledging it, though eventually, 
it was eventually universally acknowledged, and there's the, there's the measurement tool for it now, and that is in many ways a legacy of the Vietnam War. Um, a lot of better veterans just didn't talk about it, um, and it just they, not much attention was paid to it. But there's some data now, and um, this is from a number of different studies that have been done, that probably one of every 20 veterans, um, and these the symptoms, bad dreams, irritability, and flashbacks are symptoms of PTSD. Korea, up to 30 percent uh, may have symptoms of PTSD, but you know these are not people who it was identified at the time and have been treated for it. <coughs> 30% of uh, Vietnam vets have suffered from symptoms of PTSD. Um, and so um, here's what we know so far about the current, um, the current veterans. But um, a lot of people say this is definitely an underestimation because this is the people who by self-identify, who have sought treatment, um, who are willing to talk about it. Um, these are, these are stark numbers and they continue to be in flux, uh, but given the prevalence of TBI and its association with PTSD, it stands to reason that these numbers are going to increase. And the other, um, the other element to the PTSD prevalence is that um, there's some research being done on levels of PTSD and other uh, stress disorders on families of veterans. And multiple deployments is creating, is making it, each time someone's deployed, their PTSD gets worse, the family's length of deployments and number of deployments is becoming an association with how that affects families. Um, according to a VA report in 2007, the number of service-connected disabilities for mental disorders doubled from, 2000, doubled from the years 2001 to 2005, which is the last year that it was really reported, um, and with mental disorders accounting for about more than half of all the um, 100% service-connected disabilities. When you get out of the service with a, there's a ranking of disabilities and, you know, it sort of depends on is it a leg, is it an eye, is it an arm, how, what percentage, and half of them now of the 100% service-connected disabilities are due to mental disorders. Um, any questions so far? Go ahead. Right, right, right. No, no, I understand what you're saying. Well, I don't know that anyone has um, drawn a, a definitive answer to that. There is some, uh, com there some studies have compared the pre-deployment, uh, now that they're doing pre-deployment the assessments, they didn't used to do that. So they're trying to create a baseline and um, most of the, the, the one or two studies I've read that talk about that say it's still, it's an elevated level. Um, are they, I mean, in some ways you think they might be more likely to be aggressive, but yeah, I don't know. Um, are they more prone to PTSD? I don't know that anyone's definitively looked at that. Um, they're just starting to look at that and um, uh, there, you know, nobody seems to agree. I mean, you, you guys know when you read studies, it says at the end, this needs more study. <laughs> well, it actually needs funding, but, but no, I, I read a couple and they didn't really agree with each other and they had, to, they wanted to factor in other uh, resiliency. They, the last study I read said that the resiliency appears to be about the same, um, but women are more subject to um, stressors that are outside of the deployment. There's family pressures they may be more susceptible to post-deployment pressures than the, their male colleagues. In, in the war zones, they're more susceptible not just to the conflict but to harassment. Uh, there's a certain amount of sexual trauma that women are facing. So that's definitely, people are just starting to look at that. Right, right. Um, there definitely have been included in some of the studies and, but again, I, you're right, I don't think they're included as much as they might be. Some people are, uh, there was a study I read that talked about um, the role of even just the idea that you might be deployed. Um, that, and then I, I, I mean, anecdotally met a guy who, uh, the fact that he, he was in Iraq, but he never got off his base, but he himself felt like he had some PTSD from the stress of knowing he might, or, um, and then there's a certain amount of guilt because other people did and other people got injured. Um, 
but um, obviously the rates among the boots on the ground people are higher than uh, the Navy or the Air Force, but um, I, I don't know that anybody's really separated it out. I mean, it, it took the DOD a while to actually start really dealing with the issue and talking about it because, frankly, I, I mean, if you're going to assess people for PTSD and whether you can redeploy them, um, this could, you know, there's going to be a real shortage of, of people to deploy. And when we were listening to the stories, it was always that the Army um, didn't recognize right. the symptoms as right. quickly as some physicians right. Right. might be outside the military. And now the military has, there's the National Study for PTSD, which is a, a DOD-related um, um, institution and also then there's the problem of people not wanting to I identify as having this problem uh, either because there's a general societal taboo about mental health issues but there's also a feeling that it might affect their careers uh, I guess I need to pick up the pace here huh um, I was going to show you a, a short online piece but this is a I did a, a story about a guy just talking about his PTSD and talking about how in the war zone you just sort of, you suck it up, don't talk about your emotional reaction to things, wait till you get home, and then when you get home, uh, does the community really want to hear about it? Does your family really want to hear about it? And, and so again, this is, this is what makes treating it very difficult. Um, any other questions? Okay, so this is, um, there's obviously depression, there's high rates of substance abuse, there's community violence. Um, a number of sources, including the Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America, are reporting elevated instances of subject abuse, sub, substance abuse and domestic conflict. Uh, but as I said earlier, the mental health effects of the wars are complicated by the fact that a lot of the veterans still subscribe to the taboo about reporting their mental health issues. Um, so the major difference between the, the current wars and previous wars, which again c relates back to the, the mental health issues and some of the other public health issues, um, as, as, I, as I said earlier, we have acknowledged the public health effects of Vietnam, um, but they're also past, uh, the, one of the big differences is the multiple deployments that are going on now. And uh, past studies have shown a correlation between repeated exposure to trauma especially a trauma such as combat and increased distress with, it, with each exposure. Somebody asked about gender differences. There have been, there was a recent study published in the um, Journal of Abnormal Psychology that discussed that women have a tend to be exposed to a lower level of combat trauma, but the pre-deployment and post-deployment influences um, and what I'm calling extracurricular stress, like family and sexual harassment, are actually greater for women. Um, and again, why is this important? Because it affects parenting, it affects uh, family life, and in the final outcome, it affects health outcomes, not just for deployed soldiers, but their kids. I mean, I, you know, the National Children's Study is doing this longitudinal study on health, you know, health influences on kids, and part of me wishes that they would do the subset of um, military families and how serving in the war zone affects the health of that child from the day that child is born because of the mental health. Um, and there's, you know, there's obviously some environmental exposures that affect, that they're still evaluating the genetic effects of environmental exposures. Um, and a lot of the mental health issues are um, exacerbated by this disconnect when they get home and people are like, oh yeah, I guess there's a war on, but you know, I lost my week of vacation at work. I mean, I'm not minimizing the, the economy, but these, guys, these folks are coming home to a bad economy. They can't get jobs, but they're also coming back to a less than sympathetic community that is now focused on their own personal problems. Um, during the Vietnam War, at least, the public was engaged on either side of the debate, um, especially the, the troops' own generation, because they were the ones being drafted and protesting the war and now they come home to a public that they perceive as disinterested and more focused on their personal issues. Um, so nearly one-third of the troops have been deployed more than once, um, but 20,000 members of the U.S. Army, and I don't know about the other, I don't know about the Marines, have been deployed five or more times. I mean, I have this, it's not funny, but my joke was, I guess they're waiting till everybody has PTSD. I just keep redeploying people until it's 100%. Um, 
All right, so then we get, I'm sure you've started to read about, it's been in the news, there are high rates of suicide. I, there don't seem to be any great figures. I mean, I heard someone the other day say that, you know, every week 16 military people commit suicide. I, I don't know where those figures came from. I, the military's own figures don't have it being quite that high, but um, I don't know how much there. And then there's a lot of, was it suicide or was it something else? And so there's, it takes them a while to acknowledge that something was a suicide. Um, these are some of the figures that I have. Um, one is just from the Army. Um, you have the people who uh, committed suicide and you have the attempted suicides. Um, the figures vary, but the takeaway is that the rate is higher than in the civilian community. And again, it may be that people are predisposed, and I don't know that anyone's done a baseline on the population of, uh, of the military population. Uh, the drop in attempts may actually be due to one of the few interventions going on and that now there are actually pre-deployment briefings uh, among the military before they head to the war zones. And part of this is there's a major general, uh, his name is Mark Graham, whose son was in training in ROTC and committed suicide. His other son, his old, the, this kid's older brother, had deployed, was somewhat of a war hero. He may have been predisposed to depression anyway. Um, but there's a certain, uh, there's some talk about the role of stress as an impending combat on um, personnel. And, uh, I can't mention that PTSD, there's also other articles mentioning too, uh, um, what's it called? Parents who are often stressed out, like there could be like patterns of stress because their friends, their parents are stressed out. Right, right, if the exactly. show any yes. like, Yes, there, and there are actually some studies going on about this is another public health effect of the war. People come home with PTSD. How does that affect their children? And especially if you think about it, we now have kids who are about 10 years old who one or both parents have redeployed and deployed and come and gone their whole lives. We know that there's been research done on the role of separation on children and how that affects their health. Um, but yeah, and then there's living with, you know, if parents have mental health problems, there's a, how does that affect the children? Um, another quick graphic, this is from the uh, Department of Defense actually has a suicide event report. Um, it's, a, it's an annual report. So this shows um, obviously the rates among reservists seem to have gone down and then flattened out, but that may also be because of uh, there's a, we're relying less on reservists to fight the wars. Um, but um, the total and the regular, from regular, our active duty has actually gone significantly up. Um, I'm going to show you another video. Um, this is about a woman whose son committed suicide. And so again, this is not just, she talks a little bit about the stresses on him. And this is a, a short version of a, I think, 20 minute video. Um, she was a chaplain, she's a chaplain at the VA um, who coincidentally, her only son committed suicide. And I actually met her when I was working on the story about Frank. Um, but she wasn't ready to speak publicly about it. And then this general, that I, major general that I just told you about, he took up the cause about suicide in the military and he convinced her to speak publicly at a, at a conference in Texas. And then I had been in touch with her and then she called me and said, okay, I'm ready. It's important for the public to know about this. So I'll just show you a little bit of this. If I've talked to people or at some sharing circles with other parents, they inevitably say, yes, my son John died in the night in the draft, or he was the driver and uh, you know, he had the purple heart and that. And so do I say, you know, my son died by suicide, and no, he, he doesn't have a purple heart, and he'll never have a purple heart, because we don't give purple hearts to folks who are taking their lives, you know, you have to die in combat.
kind guys that he avoided us and friends with. And I wish that he could have met some of them because some of the guys that I talked to were so much like you know, going through the war and coming back. They talk about losing their innocence and losing a part of themselves. Um, so again, in there you have not just how it affected her, uh, her seeing, uh, you know, for every kid like her son, there's all these other kids that, you know, maybe didn't commit suicide. And in his case, um, the detail on that is, his was sort of a textbook case of how to not deal with someone who might be suicidal. He, I mean, again, who knows if his commanding officer has mental health stresses of his own, but he had also begun to question the mission of the war. Um, I, I mean, I think he, it sounds like he questioned it a lot from the beginning, but was already in the military. And he was particularly questioning the way he felt that they were treating Iraqis at checkpoints. And, and he began to sort of argue about this. And he, but he'd also been, um, people had noticed that he wasn't feeling well, that he was having sort of emotional problems. But his commanding officer sent him off to go do something like man a checkpoint by himself with nobody else around. And even in her case, and this gets back to the figures, um, it took the military a long time to rule it a suicide. Um, first they ruled it an accident, then they ruled it some other things, and it took, she really, and she had resources. You know, she's a VA chaplain and she has connections and it took her a while to get the actual report that acknowledged that it was suicide. Um, and so I'm going to just run through the rest of these very quickly. So motor vehicle accidents, as you know, in, in the burden of injuries by the war. Uh, the guy that you saw playing the guitar that was a patient at the VA, he actually, his injury, he lost his leg in a car accident after he got home. Um, there's a high rate of motor vehicle accidents among returning soldiers. And apparently there always has been, but it's a, some of it's attributed to TBI and PTSD. Uh, people sort of suddenly seeing something go in front of their car and they, when they've just come from a place when that happens you immediately hit your brakes and you go over the median but you can do that in the war zone um, and this guy who was playing the guitar who had lost his leg in a car accident also he was in the PTSD unit at the hospital so and I remember when I first started going over to the VA I mean like everybody else I saw a guy walking around who lost a limb I figured he lost it in the war zone most of the people you see at the VA who've lost limbs have lost them in car accidents after coming home um, some people lose their limbs in combat, but um, it's not as common. Uh, a whole lot of the patients now at the VA, uh, the younger patients are actually there uh, because of injuries that they sustained once they got home from the war. Um, Is there any discrimination in, uh, against the coverage or support they receive? You know, I don't know. That's a great question. Um, because that has to do with them using their veterans' benefits versus the, the obligation to, um, to treat people who've been injured in the war. I don't know. That's a great question. Sounds like a study. Yeah. <laughs> Everything's a study, right? No, it, it, um, I imagine, uh, I know for a while there was a big deal being made to make sure they were serving the needs of the families and of people who'd been serving in the war zones. I don't know if that's still, like, the, you know, it was sort of the hot topic for a while. And now that they're bringing everybody home, they're like, okay, how can we save money? Um, so that's a great question. I, I, I don't know. Um, so, and then we know there's environmental damage. There were the, I'm sorry, go ahead. They do. There are... Um, the Palo Alto VA actually had one, has had one for a long time, but there are special programs for women to deal with trauma, the sexual trauma that they've been through. Um, but again, I imagine that's really hard if you want to stay in the military to talk about that. I mean, I, again, I, I think that um, that's something they're just starting to acknowledge. I mean, it's acknowledged more now. Apparently, it was a problem during the first Gulf War when women also deployed, but it's being acknowledged more now. Um, and again, the car accidents, you know, obviously that injures not just the drivers, but passengers and the community. And so there's a larger consequence of that. Um, you have community violence and crime. Um, just very quickly on that, uh, and I was referred to this earlier. So you remember the shooting that happened at Fort Hood um, a few years ago? 
Right after that shooting happened, the New York Times did an article about Killeen, Texas, which is a military town that had this huge increase in violent crime and domestic violence reports and more of an increase in other comparable other towns of comparable size and you know this was more of an anecdotal report but you know it calls into question if this is directly related to the consequences of the war because at this point the war had been going on for a while a lot of people had been multiply deployed by then um, and so it would I don't know if there's a lot of data available on the rates of these things in military towns I do know that there are judges who are in, in some states they've, de they've, they've established courts just for veterans. Uh, partly because they feel like if, if, what, if the crime being committed was partly related to the PTSD, they need a special court. But there's also, it's an, indicator, an indication of the rate of crime among veterans that they're feeling the need to even establish these courts because they, they need to keep busy all day and there needs to be a full enough docket. Any questions? Okay. Um, so as I said earlier, the new collateral damage is going to be found in how multiple deployments uh, have affected children and spouses. Um, and while most media coverage and research, as I said earlier, also has been devoted to how the multiple deployments have affected troops, uh, researchers have also begun measuring the damage done to military families as well. Um, there are a number of studies released in 2010 that looked at anxiety among children six to eight. Uh, and there's a cumulative effect in, somebody asked about this earlier, not only do they have their own stress, they're living with parents who come home and try to reintegrate and also have stress. Plus there's the stress on the parent who stayed home and was not deployed. And so children are living with uh, people who themselves have mental health issues. Um, the mental health anguish for children is not caused only by the awareness that their parents are in dangerous war zones, but it's exacerbated by the psychological problems in parents when they return home, and as I said, in the non-deployed parents. Um, the authors of uh, some of the studies have also pointed out that many of the multiple deployments since 2001 have occurred during key stages of a child's development and, uh, or, or significant portions of their childhood. And so there's also an interest in how that affects children's health. Um, in 2010, there was a study that looked at the effect on adolescents. Um, you know, they, there was some evidence that it has a disciplining effect on adolescents because they kind of have to step up and be more responsible, but they're also found to have increased anxiety and stress um, and definitely had a negative effect on their, func their academic functioning in schools. And especially when they're in non-military communities uh, because there's less um, support and less sort of moral support as an, an actual support than they have in military communities. And so, and the period of reintegration they found is also particularly a st particularly stressful time. And now people have also looked at the wives of deployed soldiers, and you guys can read, so I won't read it to you. Um, there was a correlation with the length of time the spouses were deployed and the number of times they were deployed. Um, there's a lot of research that's currently underway, so there's not a lot of results yet, but um, my concern, as I said earlier, is um, it's really the families and the effects on families that's going to fall between the cracks uh, when funding dries up. You know, we, um, we have a very short memory here, and already they're talking about, oh, we need to make sure that we're taking care of the veterans, but the question is, what about their families? And this is really the long-term effect, in addition to the di disability in the soldiers. Um, the past few years has been money in the White House budget for targeting help for military families, but my prediction is that that will dry up. And I'm almost done. I know I'm running a little bit late here. And then, of course, we have Iraqi refugees. Um, and there were, as you know, after the March 21st, when we called it shock and awe, there were two waves of refugees. Um, there was a smaller wave at the onset of the war, and then the larger one was in 2006 after the uh, the bombing of the mosque in, um, I forgot, was it Samara, perhaps? Um, so there's two million Iraqis that have been displaced outside of Iraq, 40,000 in the U.S. And I don't even know how many people know that there have been this many Iraqis settled, resettled in the U.S. They've gotten some publicity. Um, forget the Maryland statistic, I'm sorry, I stole that from my Hopkins presentation. <laughs> um, and so this is just a little bit of a distribution around the country. Uh, California, um, 
California and Michigan have the largest percentage. Uh, there's a lot in San Diego, and there's a lot up in the San Jose area. Um, they're professionals. Some of them are war widows. A lot of them are professionals, which also creates a different dynamic. And it's also the way in which it's affected health in Iraq, because a lot of that are public health professionals who have fled Iraq. Um, and so Iraq is being deprived of resources, but people are coming here, and there's a, a, a lot of stress that they're feeling because they can't do the professions here that they did there. And they can't support their families in the ways that they anticipated. Um, there's also um, some dangers of, um, so there's two definitions. There's refugees and then there's the SIV holders. SIV holders are the Iraqis who worked as, for the US as interpreters. Um, so these are just a few research questions that I would pose about Iraqi refugees. Um, and the re-traumatization came up because I actually did a, qual a qualitative project when I was at Hopkins interviewing Iraqi refugees in Baltimore, the Baltimore area. And because of resources, they're not settled in, they're settled in fairly low income, high crime neighborhoods. And every single person we talked to had either been a victim of violent crime or witnessed violent crime. One guy described coming home to his neighborhood and the cops were chas chasing drug dealers and there were helicopters flying overhead. And I thought, wow, this sounds like Baghdad. Um, and this is a guy who'd had to flee through crowds in traffic in Baghdad because of his work with the US military. So, and there have been some studies actually done about re-traumatization. There was a study done, I think, in Long Beach of, of Cambodian refugees uh, after the war, after people came here and were also similarly settling in high crime neighborhoods and how that re-traumatizes people. Um, the cognitive dissonance, which I, 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 this is anecdotal, but I know there's, uh, I suspect there's more of it than we know, is people are coming here, they're living in the US, but they don't feel safe and secure because they're actually angry at the US because the U.S. started, uh, invaded the country, that's why they're here, and, I, and so there's, what does that cognitive dissonance does do for mental health as well? And, you know, we need to look at the rates of PTSD among um, Iraqi refugees as well. And I timed this, it's, it's 12.59. So, are there any questions? I'm sorry to rush through this, but. Oh, I know. Oh, my goodness. Wow, she's really. Yeah, she asked me to come because. Her I daughter is a student or on the wait list. She's a student. She's your niece, you said? She's my niece. She's on a wait list in the, public, in the war yeah. public health class. And I wish it were up to me, but. She asked me to come because, you know, I, I lived the war in Lebanon. So oh, I'm okay. Just, I'm yeah. I'm 75, so after the Israeli invasion. And, you know, some of the symptoms you have to talk about, I, you know, we had to go through it and especially as a woman. You know, yes. Because women, they have to take care of everything. The husband has to go to work, and the woman has to be, uh, you know, take decisions that might affect her kids' lives and, uh, you know, safety. You know, should I send them to school today, or should I keep them at home? Right. There's a bomb, there's whatever. But, you know, after I came here, uh, you know, when you're there, everybody's going through the same emotion. Right. So you can't complain. You cannot say, you know, what's my own? I'm attacking me, but what is attacking your neighbor, your, everybody around you? So when I came here for a whole month, I had nightmares. Hmm. And I would scream at night and hmm. wake up my husband, you know, just scream at him and tell, you know, and, and call his name. Hmm. It took me a month until I went through the whole nightmare mm -hmm. to realize, you know, I, I thought my kids were going through a bomb, mm -hmm. a car mm -hmm. bomb, so I was calling him to go that, to that. The hmm. effect of war, as he said, you know, no, no war is a good war. Right. And no matter what, the effect on the woman and the children is unbelievable, you know, even, even, and you know that reminds me because and I don't know if it was Tala but somebody in the class I'm teaching pointed out and it may have been Tala because she was talking about Lebanon that there's a rate of aggression uh, in the society now and in people's personalities that did not exist before um, and if you think about so I mean you know a lot of this is transferable here I mean you have the nightmares um, People have nightmares here. Kids are kids have nightmares about what happened to their parents. They see it on the news. They have their classmates saying, "Oh, who did your father kill today? Or did your father get killed?" Or, and so, um, and and again, I think um, you bring up something that, um, you know, just because you've left Lebanon doesn't mean the mental health stress has left you. And so, people come here from war zones. They're part of the community. Their health is part of the public health. And so. Um, you know, this, I don't need, this is pretty obvious, I guess I don't need to point it out. Um. Um, I, have two, I, I think you can say that PTSD doesn't transfer to people not necessarily in the combat zone as well. 
Right. I was actually watching a documentary on the Secret Service. Yes. Yes. The one that um, President Kennedy was shot in, and he was like, I um, actually had to like quit my job because of right. the stresses of watching the president get shot. Right. Like right in front of me. So. Right. No, that's definitely yeah. true about PTSD. Um, I did meet somebody from the Wounded Warrior Project, and this is probably true, um, that he would like to see psychology programs develop a subspecialty of pe looking at treating people whose PTSD is from a, from war and. Because the symptoms may be the same, but if you're if you're treating the symptoms based on treating how do you cope with people's experiences, they they need to ask the right questions. I mean, they don't. I don't know if they're equipped. He doesn't feel like most people are equipped to deal with the questions of how specifically war affected people, uh, and it may not be necessary. I'm sure there are psychologists who would say it doesn't matter. It's the creation of the stressors. There's there's physiological uh, component to PTSD, but you're right. PTSD. Uh, and, and, and speaking of PTSD, I thought about this the other day. Um, my mother was in a car accident, and well, everybody's fine, but the police officer who showed up was very unfeeling, very sort of gruff with us, didn't ask anybody if they were okay. And, and my first instinct was to be annoyed, and my second instinct was I looked at him, he looked very military. I don't know if this guy was in the war zone. I don't know if he has PTSD, and so are we screening people? who are going to be police officers for PTSD. And I don't know if they do. I don't think that departments do that. And you could have PTSD for other reasons, too. But a lot of people are coming back from the military and wanting to join the police. I mean, it was weird. I mean, this is how much I view everything in life through this, this filter. Because initially, I was like, I was really mad. And then I thought, oh, well, yeah, maybe he has PTSD from the war. Because he, pardon? Yeah, and he has a gun, and I don't, and you know, I don't know what the trigger is. But no, really, I, I think um, I suspect that he is. He had that that bearing about him that is very familiar if you've spent time with people in the military. Yeah, well, great, you know, so, uh, or get jobs as security guards. There, is, there was a new uh, phrase. Well, I, I, yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that. There is a there's a center in I forget where they're located. It's called the Dart Center, and it's it's actually they have programs. Columbia. Yeah, it's at Columbia. Oh, I know you. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I'm looking at this woman, thinking she's familiar. We worked together in Detroit years ago. Um, right. So the Dart Center, though, I personally didn't find. I actually called them looking for some help and I didn't find them very helpful but right I, I actually um, I think one of the many things that would be interesting to do was be to, right to look at how it's affected look how does it affect communities how does it affect if you're the the minister who's had to bury you know 10 kids how does it affect teachers who have to deal with the fact that their children that the kids have have um, so I think the peripheral effect is enormous but I think um, you're definitely right about journalists, because I know journalists. I've, first of all, I don't think you can go to a war zone and not be affected. If, if you say you're not affected, there's a major uh, denial going on, is my own personal view. Um, but I know people who have been in Iraq a whole bunch of times, and it's clear to me that some of them have some serious uh, PTSD symptoms, if not other stresses. Um, and you're right, no one ever. Yeah, no, everybody forgets about journalists, you know. Oh, who cares? Just go, no, go cover this press conference. Coping mechanisms. Um, I don't know if there's studies. I, I would assume there have been because part of the pre-deployment uh, briefing is coping mechanisms. But the one pre-deployment briefing I went to, um, it was more um, what to look, what signs to look for, especially suicidal behavior in, you know, other soldiers. Um, that's a great question.